Got a little book too. I have a candidate today for both David Wiley's Bookshelf Essentials video series where you pull a book off your shelf that it means more to you, that you enjoy more, that really stands out, and also uh, People April, a new booktube event created by Roz at Scaly Dandling About the Books and Elizabeth at Book Kinds of Books, designed to celebrate life writing, bi biographical writing of, of all kinds. Really, this book would serve for both. Uh, this is from 1992. It's The Reckoning by Charles Nichol. And it's his examination of the death of the famous Elizabethan playwright, Christopher Marlowe. If you know nothing at all about that death, you will still have heard about it. You will have heard that he died in a tavern brawl in Deptford in 1593. Uh, of course, thumbnail descriptions like that are always wrong. And when you dig into this one, you realize right away that the picture is much more complex. I remember thinking that the picture was much more complex long before this book came out. Thinking about all the elements of that day. It wasn't a tavern, first of all. It was the, the woman who ran it was connected with the palace, and her house was not, it was not a tavern. Even if it had been a tavern, how odd would it be for Marlowe to show up there and spend all day. This wasn't, he didn't show up at supper time and get drunk and fight about the bill two hours later. He was there all day with three other men. Which is mighty odd because Deptford is some distance from where he had to report every day. He was, uh, he was on parole essentially from uh, Queen Elizabeth's Privy Council. They were expecting him to report in person to them every day as it's pretty easy to read between the lines, an alternative to simply being locked up. You don't want to be locked up, so report. you have to report to us every day. There he is all the way out in Deptford at this house with these three guys all day long. It's only at the end of the day that he dies. And according to the coroner's inquest that was held shortly afterwards, uh, after Marlowe's body had been dumped in a common pit, so you didn't have a corpse to look at, uh, those men gave an account of what happened in that room. And even before this book came out, long before this book came out, I would read anthology collections of historical whodunits, historical mysteries. Always this gets a mention. Because the thing that they describe isn't even physically possible. They're all it isn't, they're all seated at a table, side by side with each other on one side when Marlowe attacks one of them from behind and somehow manages to get his own dagger in his head, sufficient to kill him instantly. Try that. Tuck your legs underneath a picnic table and have somebody on either side of you. And then and have someone accost you from behind and try to, to do the wound that we're told happened here. Because we don't know. We have no idea. Uh... But that always struck me as odd. The death itself could not have happened the way it's described. And Marlowe was, he was a famous playwright. He dumped his body in a common grave. There's, there's no to-do. There's only an inquest because, there was an inquest because the violence happened within what was called the verge, which was a, a length of space, a certain arbitrary length of space in which violence happens uh, while the queen is in that range. If she's personally there, then the violence is viewed as a matter of state, and there is a state inquiry, an, an official coroner. Uh, but none of that struck me as right long before this book came out. Why would this take all day? If this is an assassination, then why would it take all day? And if it's not an assassination, then why would it culminate in such a weird way? Uh, and what was Marlowe doing there all day? It always struck me as strange, but then you look back at the rest of Marlowe's life, and this, this book covers that. This will work really well as an introduction to Marlowe's life. It's mostly about his death. Uh, but if you look back to his life, you encounter lots and lots of blank space, lots and lots of, of areas where, intriguingly, we know nothing. But every once in a while, something will protrude over the surface of the water that definitely looks strange. And I don't mean strange because we don't have the details or strange because the, their time was different from ours, but genuinely, genuine indications that something was happening that we don't know, that we probably will never know. Something that was either never recorded or for which the records were destroyed. 
a second life to Christopher Marlowe. Second lives are proposed for historical figures all the time. Hey, what if so-and-so was actually something else in addition to what we know? Francis Bacon, famously, has, is often given that second life as the author of William Shakespeare's plays. But with Marlowe, with Marlowe, we know for sure. We know for sure. He is, he is uh, awarded his degree. For instance, when his school was not going to award him a degree, suddenly they are told to by the Privy Council, who, are, who basically tell them he's been on service for the kingdom. He's been doing good service for his queen and his kingdom, and you just don't know about it. You're ignorant of it. But that's not going to mean that he that you're going to cost him a degree. So award him his degree. Unprecedented. Just absolutely unprecedented for such a thing. And we know that happened. But we don't know why. We don't know what those services were. Uh, in... in uh, 1592, Marlowe is <laughs> arrested and charged with counterfeiting, which is a high crime, akin to treason. It would mean imprisonment. It would mean mutilation or branding. It might mean torture. It might mean death. And that doesn't happen to him. It just, the, the, once again, the state reaches in and just stops it from happening. There was clearly something more to this figure than we know. Clearly. That is not, in most cases, when you read someone do that, it's historical reconstruction as fancy. But not in this case. In this case, there's clearly something more going on here than we know. And we probably never know. Uh, and I think it culminates in this weird death. Especially since, the, and another thing that makes this a candidate for People April, is that Nickel does an unbelievable amount of background biographical research into the three men who were in that room. Finds out all about them, and it turns out, oh, it turns out they were just about the last three men you would ever want to be in a room with. <laughs> especially if your name was in disrepute, especially if you were on remand to the Privy Council and maybe more of a problem to them than, than a help. Nickel is great at going through, the, at finding those men, tracing them through the records. This is a perfect illustration of how thrilling history can be. Not just a matter of dead dates and stale documents in dusty archives. Not at all. If you think that way about it and that stopped you from reading it, it's, I, as I've said many times before, that's only because you haven't read the right history. That's all. That's, you've read history by authors who think that all they have to do is show up and disgorge their research, and they've done their job. That isn't true. That has never been true. <laughs> so this, this goes back to uh, an, all the way to the beginning of history, where you have a scholar who had lots of experience, lots of knowledge, did lots of research, backed up the dump truck of that research onto the page, and didn't bother to tell an interesting story. Whereas you at the same, you also have an author writing about some of the same subjects, some of the same research, but remembering to tell a great story, even if it means he strays outside the bounds of uh, what strictly happened and what didn't. Those are the two schools of history writing, and they start with Herodotus and Thucydides, so, <laughs> uh, and they just keep going. And I've made it pretty clear which of those schools I prefer. If you have been subjected to dry, boring history, you ought to read this book to show you that it's not settled and it's not boring. Nickel goes at the, 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 that obviously odd story, the obviously odd story of Marlowe's life. What was that second life? We'll never know. But he goes at it and does more spade work, especially about that last room, the people in that room. He does more of that than any 10 scholars have done, and it's incredible. It, he manages to make it very, very readable. Some of you may have been exposed to this author with uh, his Shakespeare book, The Lodger. Also very good along the same lines, but slightly more barren lines, right? There isn't a single thing about Shakespeare that has not been studied by legions and legions of people. Not so here with the three men in that room with Marlowe. So here you get not only the thrill of historical research, but the thrill of historical revelation. And by the time Nickel is done profiling not only what we know of that other Marlowe, but also profiling the three men in that room and the hostess of the house, by the time he's done with that, the very last thing that you will believe is that this was just a drunken brawl that got out of hand when 
a bunch of guys decided at the end of the day, well, night's coming on, we'd better settle accounts. And things got heated. The very last thing you will believe is that. <laughs> You'll believe. Uh, instead, you will start to see a big, broad, shadowy apparatus that was at play here. And that all four of these men were part of that apparatus in one way or another. Just enthralling. Just absolutely enthralling. Uh, this I, I've recommended this to many, many people. Uh, and I go back to it all the time. Uh, so it definitely counts as a bookshelf essential, but also people, April, all sorts of people are profiled in it. it to, they're not the best people in the world, but it's still, it's absolutely fascinating to watch Nichol piece together the lives of these figures uh, and Marlowe's life. So, so there you go. A little, a little uh, book spotlight for your Sunday. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you.